All right. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Black on Black Education podcast. We are here with our guest. And as always, we allow you to tell the listeners and viewers who you are, what you do, and why you do it. My name is Aisha Jackson. I am an assistant professor of teacher education at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. In that role, I mostly work with our master students who are in an alternative route to licensure program. And there are so many reasons why I do it. Um, first of all, I was a high school English teacher myself certified through an alternative route. And although some people might believe that alternative routes are fast tracked and it's putting the, the worst teachers in the worst schools and it's adding to the problems that we know we can have in some under-resourced schools, I also know that it's an opportunity for people who might have changed their majors or decided later in life to become teachers to enter into the profession in a manner that doesn't disrupt their lives. And if, if recruitment is right, we can find some high quality candidates to enter the field and become teachers in those same under-resourced schools. Um, University of Nevada, Las Vegas is classified as an HSI. So I have the privilege of working with a high number of Black and Latinx pre-service teachers. And I absolutely enjoy working with them and what I'm able to do introducing them to the profession in a manner that I hope centers culturally relevant and responsive and sustaining practices as part of their introduction to what it means to be a teacher. Thank you so much for that introduction, Aisha. Um, how about we do this? Like uh, alternative route, you know, I, I am completely you know vulnerable here because I, I had not heard that specific language. I think I get where you're going, um, mm -hmm. but let's talk about exactly what that is and HSI. I'm, I'm, I don't know. So let me know. <laughs> what, what does that mean as well? Absolutely. So alternative route routes, plural to licensure, are programs that target candidates into the teaching profession who have degrees in something other than education. So in states like Nevada, you could get certified to become a teacher as an undergrad. But if you had an undergrad in history or an undergrad in psychology or a degree in marketing, and then later in life you decide that you want to become a teacher, an alternative pathway would allow you to do that without necessarily spending another four years in a bachelor's degree to get certified. And so alternative routes take on all kinds of shapes and forms. TFA, for example, Teach for America, could be considered an alternative route to licensure. Um, there are a lot of programs in the country starting to gain traction around Grow Your Own. So people are reaching out to community members who might be um, graduates of school districts to get them certified to teach within that district. Our program at UNLV is open to everyone. As long as you have a bachelor's degree, it's a master's level program that will allow you to become a teacher. <laughs> Our program actually um, allows people to get their provisional license, that initial certification in one semester. So you take three courses, nine credits, you can get your provisional license provided that you pass certification exams and then your teacher of record as you finish the program to get your master's degree and your standard teaching license. HSI is, is a little bit more complicated. It's a federal designation as Hispanic serving institution which is given to colleges and universities based on their enrollment of Latinx identifying students um, at the institution. We're now starting to have the conversation about what it means to be HSI in terms of Hispanic or Latinx serving versus Hispanic or Latinx counting. We do really well at identifying students and counting them and using that to get federal designation, but how are we actually doing the work of serving the student population? and the rest of our students of color on campus. I think that's an ongoing conversation and I don't know that we have the answers yet. You saw me. You saw me get a little bit sad because you, you said you have to have a bachelor's degree, and you know I don't have one of those, so you know I, I can't I can't join the program. <laughs> yet we are actually working on a new model at UNLV that will okay. help people who don't have their bachelor's but want to become teachers do so faster than a four year program. So we're looking at kind of a, a two year model that would allow people to get into the classroom faster with certification because. Yes, um, we're finding that there are a lot of people in our community here 
that would love to be teachers and they have relationships with students. Some of them are paraprofessionals. They're working as mm -hmm. instructional assistants in schools or other roles within the school environment, but they don't necessarily wanna go back to finish a bachelor's, start over with fo a four year program to get certified. So we're in early conversations to develop a model that will allow that to happen in a shorter time frame than a traditional four year bachelor's program. That's awesome, that's awesome. Um, and I went to an HSI, I went to John Jay College of Criminal Justice in um, New York City. So I, I definitely am familiar. Uh, that was that was a great rundown. You like gave folks kind of everything that they needed to kind of just set up the conversation that we're about to have. So I'm really, really excited about it. Um, so let's talk about your experience as a teacher, right? We always like to get down to the nitty gritty and like talk about what that looked like when we were on um, on that level. And so I want you to talk about one year experience as, as an English teacher and then get more into where um, that experience led you to the area of expertise that you that you decided to hone in on with your research. So I started in Tempe, Arizona, and I actually taught in the community in which I lived. So as I'm having these conversations about recruiting teachers from the community, from the, na the neighborhood, that was my experience. And I found that it made a tremendous difference in my ability to connect with students when I sometimes had parent-teacher conferences in the grocery store um, because <laughs> I live five minutes away from the school and I would see families out just living their lives. I wasn't just that teacher who showed up, who drove in for um, an hour long commute to be there Monday through Friday, but I lived where I taught. And I think that that made a difference. Um, at the time, the school was, was in the middle of a demographic shift in the neighborhood where historically the, the school had been predominantly white. While I was there, it was kind of shifting to have a much larger Latinx population a much larger black population than I think some of the teachers who were veterans in that school were used to. And so I found myself as one of the only black teachers in the English department, always having a disproportionate number of black and Latinx students in my classes. Um, but that experience was those students who weren't necessarily academically successful in other people's classrooms were succeeding in mine. And it wasn't that I lowered the expectation, it's that I had different relationships with those students and I scaffold in a way that was relevant to them. I made learning fun and exciting. And so they wanted to be in my class. And more importantly than wanting to just show up, they wanted to show up for me. They didn't want to disappoint me. So I would set the bar high, I would give them those high expectations, and then they would meet them because of the relationship that we built. And I was noticing that more and more of my colleagues were struggling with some of my star students, students who were straight A English students were failing in their other classes. And I, I didn't really understand why until I started asking questions about approaches to teaching, beliefs about students, beliefs about communities, and understanding that um, a lot of my colleagues just had deficit notions. They looked down on the students and the, the community and the families. And so, my first year as a teacher, I had a student that I will never forget. He was a senior, the first and only time that I taught seniors. Um, he got all the way to April, his senior year, and decided to drop out. And he felt like he didn't have the supports that he had needed ninth grade through 12th grade. He was behind in credits in a way that was splotchy. So he, he didn't see a pathway to graduation. And although I offered to help, I was teaching a credit recovery course. And I was like, if you come into my class, I will support you in every way possible so that you can move through those credits quickly enough. By the summer, we can get you there. And he was just checked out and defeated. And I didn't ever want to have another one of those students. I didn't want to be responsible for being part of a system that sets students up to fail. But at the same time, as a young professional in the field of education, I didn't feel like I had the knowledge or the tools to make the kind of difference that I wanted to make. And so that led me to pursue my doctorate in education. So I actually moved to New York. I went to Teachers College, Columbia University, to study curriculum and instruction. And when I got to Teachers College, in my mind, I was going to get my doctorate, understand K-12 teaching and learning in order to own and operate a charter school someday. But my first experience in schools in New York was in a school within a school. 
that was a brand new concept to me coming from Arizona. Arizona has a long history of charter schools, but I had never seen a school within a school. So this particular school had a charter school on the ground level, and then the public school was on the second and third floor in the same building. And the charter school had resources, physical resources, material resources that the public school students could see but they couldn't access. So the playground belonged to the charter school kids. Public school kids couldn't use it. The cafeteria belonged to the charter school. The public school kids couldn't use it. And there was a day where I was um, monitoring students in a science lab and they were working on typing up their science lab report. And one of them was kind of saying keyboards loudly. And another student turned and said, See, that's why we can't have nice things like the charter school because we don't know how to take care of things. And I was like, wait a minute, hold up. Who, who told you that? Because that sounded to me like a message that the student had internalized that came somewhere from the outside, but became a belief that this student had about why there was disparity in access to resources in these schools. And so I was able to have a conversation. They were sixth graders. So on a sixth grade level, have a conversation about like, it's, it's not your behavior that sets up these differences. It's the structure, it's the funding. It's, it's a lot of things that doesn't have anything to do with how hard you're typing on that keyboard. And so I think from that moment forward, that ignited a new commitment to public education for me. I'm not anti-charter, but I am wholeheartedly in what I do to make a difference for public schools, because as long as they exist, we know the kids who are likely to be there are more likely to be those students and families who don't have access to additional resources that might be present in charter schools. New York City is a, is a, is a beast. So yes. definitely coming into New York City and having that kind of experience, you're right. Uh, but dad, I'll let you take it. No, I, I I I just found myself sitting here when you when you said that, like I got bored a lot emotional, like you know what I'm saying I felt bad for for, you know, for all of those students who um, they just don't deserve that, man. And and, um, and the fact that that is how the system uh, is is set up is it's it's is it's hurtful. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's deeply hurtful. So, um, I mean, salute to you for committing yourself to um, solving those challenges. I mean, here, here at Black on Black Education, you know, I mean, we are all for public schools. We are all for charter schools. We are all for homeschools. We are all for unschools. We, we are all for whatever it is gonna take, um, you know, for, for children to develop a love of learning. Because if you can make them develop a, that, that, like that, that's the ball game. It's if they, if they love to learn, then it, it, it doesn't matter what, place you put them in um they, they're going to go about the business to succeed it but how do you make help them to develop a love of learning so that that that's kind of how we 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 focus in on it so um it's it, it's i i am curious in, in terms of were you ever able when while you were still in in um in, in arizona were you ever able to um help guide the the, the teachers there um you know kind of in, in in the direction where where they understood why things were working for you but not working for them i feel like i was able to do that more implicitly than explicitly which is again the the motivation to learn more so i was certified to teach like i said through this alternative route I didn't have a lot of the language that I have now that I've studied culturally responsive teaching. I wasn't really grounded theoretically in approaches that were working for me. It's just it's just what I did, right? I could I could walk in and I locked my hair in 06. And so um, when I had my short dreads, that was a way of just starting conversations with with kids who were like, "Miss, you have dreads." Like all of the assumptions that goes along with that. Do I listen to rap music? Do I smoke weed? Right. And I would entertain those conversations with my students in ways that I don't know that all of my colleagues did. And so just opening even that up to my colleagues, I was certified at a time when we would talk about not smiling until December and not letting students know anything about your personal life because you needed to be taken seriously, especially as a young teacher. 
and I blew all of that up out of the water. Like that's not real life. You need to be a real person and a whole person. And you need to invite students in to your life as, as much as makes sense professionally so that they know they can trust you in that learning environment to have their best interest in mind. And so I would share those things, but I couldn't necessarily connect it to proven methods and strategies and language that I now have to be able to have that conversation differently. I love that. And I think that like, it brings me so, so um, effortlessly into the next question where I want you to think about how the teachers that we're speaking about right now, which are so just indicative of the system at large, um, what do they need to reconsider about their experience as students as they begin to step into this world where I mean, you are engaging with students who don't look like you, who have different experiences from you. You are, are, and there's so much information now out there about how to better support them. What do they need to reconsider um, so that they can now accept this new information that we have on how to support this population of students? And and what what is it that you would say to them? I think they need to reconsider everything. <laughs> um, and, and I think that even goes for black teachers who are entering the profession, we have been socialized to understand schooling in particular ways that aren't necessarily humanizing to us. So we need to, all of us need to reconsider our privilege in this system. Like I was labeled gifted in sixth grade. That set me on a trajectory that was totally different than everybody else. We still have systems of tracking and that gets normalized where the students who are advanced just stay advanced. We need to reconsider every part of the structure of teacher preparation. If you didn't learn about culturally relevant or responsive approaches to teaching, why didn't you? Who were those teacher educators? How, how did you think about building relationships across cultural difference? I mean, I think it starts from first examining your own relationship to schooling especially if you were that good student who has this mythical idea that learning just happens in the classroom. Um, how do you break that down to understand that no, teaching is required for so many of our students to gain academic skills. Um, if you were that bad student who, quote unquote bad student, right, who didn't like going to school <laughs> or had a, a relationship with schooling that wasn't necessarily positive, what were those experiences that shaped your reality that had you identifying in that way as a bad student? And then how do you undo and unlearn some of those things so that you're not perpetuating the system? And I think some, so much of it goes to an understanding of social foundations. Public schools were not intended to house black students simply. So we are still in what Tayak and Tobin call the grammar of schooling. I was revisiting that article yesterday, this grammar of schooling that set the foundation for what is now the culture of schooling is still in place. We haven't undone it. So if you go through this process as a teacher, as if that grammar of schooling isn't structuring your reality, you're running the risk of re-traumatizing or traumatizing kids in that process. And, and well, I think there are some racial dynamics of it, black teachers are not immune to being teachers who inflict trauma on on kids. You you said a lot there, and um and and one of the pieces that you know resonates with me, and it seems like it's starting to come up in every conversation, and that's that's heartening because it it, it becomes something um, that we can we can center a lot of this conversation around. But the the idea of of unlearning, um, and I often say to people that. Um, most of us, adults, certainly adults even more than children, we we have more things to unlearn than we actually have to learn. Um, it, 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 it's a bigger problem when you walk out and you walk around um, thinking you know a thing and you don't even know that thing. Like it's just like you you think you're right about a thing and you are just wrong. Like that's a huge problem. It inflicts all kinds of problems and challenges and trauma all over students and all over everybody who you connect with. So um, if, if it can't happen in schools and if we can't model that behavior, if, if teachers can't model that behavior for students, then students don't learn how to do it. Um, and, and they think that, that, you know, just because the thing that they believe today, uh, 
like they're supposed to walk around with that their whole life. Um, like everything that their mama taught them was right. You know what I mean? It, like, no, I love my mama, but everything she taught me wasn't right. Like I, I have to be able to, to take a deep breath and, and, and love her forever and ever and ever and know that she just, she, she, she shared with me what she thought I needed to know. Um, and, 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 te and, and for the teachers, like, it's not, I, I'm not trying to, uh, make anybody a bad person, you know what I mean? Because you might've hurt some students, um, with the way that you thought about things before the way that you believe things before. So it's not to, to cast aspersions. It's, 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 to is to make it so that the, that that we can create a better foundation um, for, for for learning for, for for students and for ourselves. And if we walk around with that spirit, um, I think it changes the whole dynamic of of uh, you know how we educate kids. Yeah, and I think it should change how we view the role of a teacher. Right, the teacher does not have to be the expert in the room who is imparting knowledge on these students who know nothing. The teacher should instead be a partner in this journey to learn together. And so you take that experiential knowledge that students bring into the room, you take their cultural ways of knowing and being, and you say, how can you, student, educate us all in a way that allows us to learn from each other? And then I'm going to put that contents piece to it or the, the academic standards piece to it so that you understand why this is important for the grammar of schooling. But then you should also have some life skills and some community skills and some personal skills so that you understand why this learning matters beyond the walls of a school building. Can you, just, can you just define grammar of schooling for me really quickly? Uh, yep, so Tayek and Tobin 1994 had an article about the grammar of schooling and they talked about how essentially the way that grammar shapes how we understand language, there is a culture that shapes how we understand schools from a graded classroom system to the fact that you need a certain number of credits to graduate from high school to the fact that there are standard subject areas that are taught in isolation, English, math, science, social studies. It's been like this for a hundred years and even all of our attempts to change it have led us back to the same place. There have been incremental changes. There are things that individual teachers or schools do to slightly disrupt this culture of schooling or grammar of schooling but we haven't come up with a new language for how to do school. Awesome article. Um, and so I think this brings me to kind of want to talk about um, changing and shifting views of students and how um, kind of adopting this idea that we can learn and grow with our students rather than learn and grow on them, how changing the view uh, of students of color and students from poverty and students with disabilities, how, and students who have varying gender identities and sexualities, how does, does changing the frame for which we look at our job as teachers uh, begin to, to, to help teachers change the view uh, of how they look at their students? Yeah, I think it's a necessary connection and relationship. If we can shift the perspective of teaching from teacher as expert, kind of that, that banking system of I have everything and I'm going to deposit it into you, to teaching and learning as an exchange. And I'm starting to use that phrase more intentionally. There's a teaching and learning exchange. I give, you give, and we're in this constant relationship of learning together. I think if you approach a, um, teaching in that way, then you don't see your students as beneath you. You see your students as your partner. You see your students as having valuable knowledge that you need in order to do your job. And while yes, that some of that knowledge is about their backgrounds, about their beliefs, about their values, it's also about what they are adding to the content, which allows us to be truly culturally sustaining. It's this way of saying you have a cultural knowledge base a way of knowing and being that is valid and valuable and can add to the texture of our learning environment. So I welcome it. And again, we're gonna all learn from each other. We're gonna maybe develop some new ways of knowing and being in community, but everything that you bring into the classroom as a student has a place here. And I think um, that's a shift in, in the role of teacher educators, which is also part of why I do what I do on the teacher ed side we need to make sure that as we're preparing teachers to do this work, we're giving them more than content and subject matter knowledge. They need the skill and the disposition 
to be able to let go of their ideas of what schooling is and what schooling was for them to be able to create an environment that is welcoming and humanizing and affirming to all of the different ways young people will show up in school spaces. What, what would you say um, the percentage of teachers that you sit down with um, that that are actually open and, and accepting of, of everything you're describing? Because to, to, to me, what you're describing is, is self-evident that, that this is the way it should be. Um, but I certainly can imagine that there are teachers that give you the eye roll and, you know what I mean, it's, I've been doing this for, you know what I mean, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, you know, can, can you share with us? And, and, you know, if you don't have a number, it's fine. But, you know, how, how you work with uh, or, or, or balance um, the, 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 two, the two sides of that coin. Yeah, and, and I will say this is one of the reasons why I love my job. So um, the demographic at UNLV for the students that I work with, they're largely students of color who are coming in with a level of, of consciousness about some of these issues. And so as the teacher educator in the room, I kind of get to model some of this where I'm sitting back and I'm letting my students teach each other because they're coming in with such different experiences of what it's like to be a student in school. And it's an environment that is very much conversational about the shifts that need to happen from the teacher perspective, because there's such diversity in the student population, racial diversity, ethnic diversity, gender diversity, sexual orientation, religion, like all of that shows up in the teacher ed classroom. So when I can step back and not hone in on a textbook and a textbook way of doing and teaching, and allowing that community environment in my pedagogy course to be how we think about pedagogy and teacher moves. And they have a conversation and then I'm like, and that's how we cover the objective for the day. Um, then I can help them think about what that looks like in the context of their own classrooms. I, I love that. I love that so much. And I think it just connects for me where you're saying something that's important, right? Because we're talking about, um, almost 80% of our school force being white people, right? And, and the majority of that are white women. Yep. So we have a very small and narrow um, outlook on what it looks like in, to be a teacher in, in the US. And we're seeing the divide between what it looks like to be a teacher in public schools and continuing what, what's happening with the demographics of our schools in general. They are becoming more and more diverse in all of the ways that you just mentioned. So I wanna just talk a little bit about um, school-induced trauma, what that is, and how it's detrimental to the outcomes of students so that we can begin um, to see our way through why everything we've already talked about today um, is so important and so integral to, 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 the, to the, the future of education. Yeah, and I feel like that example that I told about the school within a school is an example of school-induced trauma. It's any experience that is happening in that environment of schooling and in the process of schooling that makes a student feel less than, makes a student feel harmed spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, um, hopefully not physically, but I'm sure that there are levels of physical school-induced trauma as well. But when I think about school-induced trauma from a sense of what educators do, it's any and everything that invalidates the humanity of a student in the room from, you know, some, sometimes there are policies in schools like you can't wear a hat. But if you have a young man who doesn't have a haircut for whatever reason and his identity is tied to his physical appearance because he's a teenager and that matters at that age and you're forcing that kid to take a hat off because of a rule, that serves what purpose exactly. And then that student takes the hat off and his hair's not done and he's walking around being teased all day. That's how school-induced trauma can show up. And while that might seem like a slight thing to us as adults, if we can remember what that feels like as a child, it's major and it creates these barriers to wanting to be in that school environment. It makes it harder to concentrate and learn because you know people are talking about you as they're looking at the back of your head. And we don't think through those things enough in our policies and practices. And I think sometimes there's a level of, of consciousness from those of us who can understand certain kinds of lived experiences to say, okay, like you can wear your hat in my class, it's all right. But if that student then gets in trouble in the next teacher's class or gets in trouble walking from room to room because of that, then it's the environment of schooling that is not welcoming. And sometimes when, when students disengage from the process, they're not disengaging because they're intellectually incapable. 
they're in dis they're disengaging because they feel like school is not an environment for them. Their their very being is being attacked every time they come into the building. Um, New York was also the first time where I ever had to walk through a metal detector to get into a school building. And again, while people might think on a policy level that makes a lot of sense, how does it feel? I know how I felt as an adult to have to put my bag on the conveyor belt and walk through the metal detector. And if that's your reality, what message is that sending to the kids who have to go through that and be policed and surveilled just to get into a classroom? So I, I think there are lots of ways that school-induced trauma show up. And if we as educators can be aware of that, we can have critical conversations with our students about what that means and help them through social and emotional learning strategies to try to mitigate those things that are beyond our control. I love that. Just wanna, just wanna go on record to say, this is why I love doing this podcast because people say things that, like that, that example of a hat you know, it's a it's a small um, example, but it, it it I bet that there are tens of thousands of students that are that that dropped out of high school because of what happened as a result of that rule. There may be more than tens of thousands, like it, it, b because because the system said that you can't wear a hat. Make it make, make like majoring in the minor, um, yeah. as opposed to 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 the opposite. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that because it, it, it just brings a whole, you know, extra, you know, c color to it. And, and what popped into my mind while, while you were, while you were talking about it was because, uh, you know, Eva, she didn't have to go through any of the hat stuff, but I'm, I'm like sitting here thinking if I have, you know, a son who, who is going through it, I'm going to be all over this school. You know what I mean? Be, be, because they're, they're hold on, hold on, okay. because you can't just say it's boys. Because they do it right. different. It's oh, her hands, it, her her shorts are too short because she's a voluptuous black girl growing up whose body may have developed differently than a lot of the other girls in her school. It's oh, your your earrings are 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 a problem and they need to be taken out because it's how I how you express yourself. It's. It, it's it's it it shows up in different ways, mm -hmm. um, and so I I, I just want to push you there um, to to it's not a gendered issue, it's a policy issue. Touche. Yeah, touche. Um, so so I guess where I was going with that issue was just around um, parents and, and and their role in terms of engaging um, in in the school and you know what 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 you've seen done, what you what you think should be done. Yeah, and I think the issue of parents is is important because we have to remember that they also went through these systems. And so sometimes we make a lot of assumptions about this notion of parental engagement. Oh, these parents don't care because they're not showing up. Well, if school was not a place that they wanted to be and they barely made it out of, why do you want them to show up? What are you doing on the school side to get into the community, to invite conversations again, like at the grocery store or in places that aren't the school building, we, we sometimes take for granted that power dynamic that happens even in a parent-teacher conference where you're saying as the school or as the educator, come on my term and I'm going to get all of my paperwork about how terrible your child is and I'm going to read that to you and you're supposed to respond calmly and nicely and tell me how great I'm doing as your teacher. Like we, we don't necessarily unpack some of those messages that we send to parents. So then if parents have had negative experiences with schooling as a process, then their child is experiencing that same kind of, ex of school trauma. That's what I meant when I said re-traumatize. That parent could be showing up and maybe they seem angry. Maybe they seem agitated. And to that principal or to the teacher, it's not a big deal. But you've just opened a wound for that parent who's like, and now my child has to go through this? So we need to have conversations that are community embedded about how schools need to re-engage parents differently and understand that sometimes that relationship is antagonistic, not because the teacher is so wrong, but because the system hasn't been humanizing or effective for so many Black students. Okay. And I, I think um, when we can help parents, um, help teachers understand how parents are showing up and why they're showing up, we can have more productive conversations. Absolutely. Like I, it is my, my deepest hope, my fingers crossed that no school decide to only do parent teacher conferences in person ever again, ever again, 
because yeah. we don't have to, right? I, I want schools to begin to prioritize having the first conversation with, with parents, not be the parent-teacher conference when you already have a list of, of, of issues that you need to address or a list of problems where you have already had a conversation with this teacher before you've gotten there. Like parent engagement is one of the most important things to me as an educator, because one, I get to know and understand a child on a different level um, and then I also get to understand from the parent what their goals, what they want for their kid. Because I think that, so, and we've been talking about this a lot lately, but lately, but somehow the school system has forgotten who it works for. Right. Like it just, there's, well, actually it hasn't forgotten. It never was. <laughs> right. there you go. It never was for them. So then when well, now we're asking and hoping and making sure that students are getting what they need, we're doing it through the lens of, of what's convenient for the teacher and for the school, rather than doing it through the lens of what is important and what is necessary for the child. So I, I just find that whew, so incredibly important to bring in here. And then it has me preparing for the next question where we need to also talk about how school endures trauma. This is one of our last questions, but how does school induced trauma affect teachers and the demographic of the teaching force? I'm, I'm unpacking that literally as we speak. So one of the projects that I've been fortunate to work on is doing um, long-term professional development for teachers of color, Black and Latinx teachers who've gotten certified through, all, through our alternative route. And I'm doing life history research with them to, to understand what schooling was like for them and how they've chosen to become teachers and what they need to unlearn in this process of becoming the best educators that they can be and how I can play a role in that development. And I think sometimes, again, when we aren't critical about how we've been socialized into education, then Black teachers can show up and they're viewed as um, the disciplinarian. They're viewed as the mother figure or the father figure. They're viewed in these ways that add a burden to the work of trying to help students academically achieve while being culturally affirmed, because now I have all of these other expectations of who I'm supposed to be in this child's life. And so understanding what that looks like, what it means, how, how Black and Latinx teachers can take care of themselves through that process, how we can create communities of support to allow that to happen, and how we can acknowledge and address any issues of microaggressions, because we can raise our consciousness and understand these systems differently but we will probably always have colleagues who don't understand what our lived experiences are like in any meaningful or real way. And so how do you walk in your power as that black teacher on campus who people are looking at negatively or, oh, well, well, she's lowering her expectations and that's how her students have A's in the class or whatever it might be. Um, it's, it's a journey and it's a process. And I'm grateful to be on that journey with some of the most amazing young professionals that I've ever met in my life. We, we, uh, we definitely look forward to uh, being able to engage with some of the students that you uh, birthed into this work. Um, because if, if, uh, if, they've, if they've listened to you, I'm sure that they are going to be a part um, of the next generation of incredible educators. So uh, we, we, we thank you for that. So um, last but not least, what we always do is we give our, our guests an opportunity um, to ask us a question. And you know, if there's anything that we can, uh, that, 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 that we can share, um, you know, we're, we're now, now's the time. <laughs> yeah, so you've talked a little bit earlier about all of the different ways that, that education happens. And I've also been really intentional lately in my language of distinguishing education from schooling. because so I think we conflate them, but kids are educated in all kinds of spaces yeah. that are not in schools. So as you've been engaging in this, this conversation on black on black education, where are some of those spaces where you see the most meaningful learning happen that sometimes we might take for granted? It's yeah. a great question. Um, I think for, for, you know, for, for me, um, community centers, you know, there, there, there are, you know, community centers um, all over the place where, where members of the community who are not teachers um, are, teachers, you know, they, they, they you know, where, where they are, um, 
helping children to 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 learn um the the most basic of life skills that for some reason don't seem to be a priority in school um so the 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 the, the community center is is most certainly um an important role um and one of the things that that uh, you know that we'd like to see is community centers and schools develop a much more symbiotic relationship um where the folks that are at the community center they maybe they talk to the teachers more maybe the teachers talk talk um to the community center so they know that you know the kid all day he, he didn't like what was going on in school but he got to the community center and now he has a smile on his face what's happening at the community center that's not going on in school um and how can those two you know kind of kind of support one another so um that that's the first thing that comes to mind for me and then for me i think it's homeschooling I think it's something we don't think of, we don't think a lot about, and we particularly don't think about it in the context of uh, of communities of color and for, of low income communities of color because it seems inaccessible. And there are some really innovative folks out there that are saying, "No, we need to figure out how to create learning clouds, figure out how to create nonprofits, figure out how to create access um, to an individualized education and a loving relationship with education uh, for students." And so that's really kind of me where I see the future of education, particularly for students um, like I serve in a, in, a, in a transfer school context in New York City. Um, it's really important to think about for a student who is in 11th grade on a fourth grade reading level or 10th grade on a fourth grade reading level, they need something very different than what the, what the traditional schooling system can provide. And so um, how do we create something that's scalable, that's big enough uh, to, support, to support those sorts of kids um, in the way that they need it? Yes, yes to both of those. I think homeschooling, hopefully we will see an uptick of that in black communities post COVID-19 with all of these conversations about returning to normal. Normal didn't serve us to start with. So let's reimagine what we can do and figure out how we do it together to be more effective. Absolutely, Lit our literal mission statement. <laughs> I actually had a call with somebody yesterday that's uh, up in, um, in in Canada. I forgot which part over, you know, close close to Vancouver, Alberta. Um, and you know, she she brought up the fact that there, um, there there it, the, the homeschoolers actually there's a connection to the to the school so that it's not like you know, they still pay their taxes and stuff so they get to go in and, and make requests to use the science lab and to um and to 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 engage with the actual school um and to when i heard that i'm like this is the best of both worlds like it, it allows the, the 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 students and and um you know where 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 their parents have um, the resources to allow them to to go and, and and be schooled at home, but then they still get to engage, you know, with with with, with some students um, in, in 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 regular classes. They get they get access to uh, some of the things that their tax pay, tax dollars pay for anyway. Um, and 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 hopefully, um, you know, the, the the public school sees like, wow, dude, some of these kids are freaking bright because you know they, they were sitting on a mountain, you know, y yesterday. Um, um, you know, do, doing yoga uh, and 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 something about that um, yeah. has them loving what they do uh, from a learning perspective. So hopefully, some of that rubs off on um, on on the traditional system because it's it's you know, unfortunately, sometimes I feel like the the only way that the the the, the status quo um, you know makes adjustments if it's, is if it gets scared um, that some of these other systems are going to be successful. Um, and so if if that's what has to happen, though, then that's what has to happen. So, uh, black and black it, education is going to leave the DOE quivering. We're ready. <laughs> Let me know how I can help, especially <laughs> the New, New York City DOE. <laughs> Let's do it. So that is it. That is another episode of the Black and Black Education podcast. Thank you all for listening, and we will see you next week. Hold on, sorry, Aisha. Please let people know how they can get in touch with you. Oh. Um, yeah, forgot about that. Uh, <laughs> let people know how they can get in touch with you. Um, how people can support your work um please yes so if you're interested in any of my scholarship i do have a profile on google scholar aisha jackson you can just google that through google scholar but you can also personally email me at dr period aisha jackson at gmail.com not really on social media I'm, I'm gonna up my game with twitter i have the twitter but please don't tweet me because i haven't sent my first tweet yet <laughs> <laughs> but i am accessible okay and so now have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>